Hey girl gang, it's Dr. Joy here and you are watching Delivering Joy MD TV. Welcome to Well Woman Wednesday, where I'm starting a new series with you guys. We are starting a series on the social determinants of health. Have you ever heard of that? The social determinants of health? Well, the social determinants of health have been defined by the CDC as the conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of their health risks and outcomes. So the social determinants of health are very important. The environment in which we are living and learning and working and playing definitely has a huge effect on our health outcomes and the risks that we run into, like risk for accidents. So we need to be well-versed in the social determinants of health. 2030 Healthy People Report, and that's kind of like the report that helps us generate our goals um, in terms of public health. So that 2030 Healthy People Report actually outlined five key areas for the social determinants of health, or ESDO for short. And so we're gonna focus in on one of those each episode. Today, we're talking specifically about the area of neighborhood and built environments. So your neighborhood makes a big difference. Do you know that we can actually look at people's health by zip code, there is a difference. And that is mainly affected by redlining. And redlining is the process by which neighborhoods were designated and certain groups of people, usually marginalized folks, were placed in certain neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods did not get the best access to quality education, quality health care, or uh, to industry or banks and hospitals and grocery stores and things that you need to make a community profitable. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. I caught up with Jaja Hurd, CEO of the LaGrange Housing Authority here in Troop County, and we had an amazing conversation about this. Check it out. So I'm reminded about redlining and about how some people were relegated to certain communities and it was usually based on race or socioeconomic status um, or even sometimes just who their parents were, who their family was. So, you know, when we think about public housing in the modern sense, um, we, we mainly see black and brown folks um, or uh, white folks who have lower socioeconomic status um, in public housing. And so that cycle of poverty often continues. Yes. How do you, how do you help your residents uh, begin to rise above that? Well, one key component is you definitely have to be an advocate for the residents. And I just want to say, you know, public housing was not intended for you or I. Public housing was created for middle class white people. Oh. It was never intended for us. We couldn't live in it. They built it and we couldn't live in it. It was built for middle class white people. And that's something that I want the community to know because we're reading the book, The Colored Law. It was never for us. But because of the way they structured it and had practices and systemic racism, once it was no longer needed, then it was given to us. But they removed all the good things from the community, like the maintenance and the upkeep of those buildings. So guess what? If I still didn't make but barely minimum wage, I couldn't afford to repair my apartment, fix things. So the apartments or the areas, the, the, they deteriorated. Mm -hmm. That's how the ghetto became the ghetto. Wow. The slums became the slums because once the war was over, they took away the people that lived there and worked there because they wanted to go buy homes, become homeowners, access wealth. They then allowed us to come in, but they didn't leave things so that we could continue the good looking ones. So they deteriorated like any. So when you put them there, that's how you get generational poverty. So my mom stayed there, my mom stayed there. Now I think this is where I should live because this is all the guy I know. I don't know anything else because somebody's introduced it. We started introducing our residents to the world. We started giving them access to things. I'm big on, if we have classes, I want to introduce them to a Joy Baker, a doctor. I don't want any doctor. I want the top notch doctor to come in there and talk to our women. They had enough mediocre, so they don't need any more mediocre. Mm -hmm. They need the highest of the highest. I wouldn't hire any teachers that's not certified. So if you were not certified, we didn't hire you to teach our children or to mentor or to tutor our children. Our children needed better. They needed to be uplifted. 
because mom may not have received a high school diploma. So now we're going to make sure mom gets a high school diploma. Then she can do work with her children. We're going to make sure mom gets to the PTO meetings with the kids. So we created a transportation department ourselves at the housing authority. So when mom needs to get to this appointment, she's going to get there. She needs to get to the school appointment. She's going to be able to get there. We gave them access to things because that's part of it. You don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. And you put it in an area where I can't walk over here to the doctor. Right. You know, there are no sidewalks. There's right. no lighting right. or any of that. So we started to ask, well, when we start to rebuild, will you give us some sidewalk city? Will you give us some lighting, some LED lighting? Right. We started to put cameras there so that we could decrease our crime rate because it wasn't our residents that were creating crime. It was other people coming on to the property doing that. And we started to really have real conversations, honestly, Joy. I mean, we would sit in a room with women and we talk. We straight up look. That is not how you do this, and we're not going to let you go somewhere else and behave that way. We taught them basic classes. You may remember June Nelson. Yes, absolutely. She comes over and teaches etiquette classes. Wow. So that they know, because we do have to present ourselves a certain way. Absolutely. You know, if we are not together all the time, something must be wrong with her, or she's aggressive. She taught etiquette classes to the young ladies. We started to introduce them to programs that are in these sororities that we're in to be around women mm -hmm. the AKs their, their chapter started meeting having their meetings on their property yeah. so the little girls could see them coming in and dressed up and they would do things with them they would add them to their debutante so that they could be a part of it some of them may never get to experience that even they'll make us have their meetings there the day, they start meeting on the property yeah. So the little girls don't like, what are they? What are they? So they did programs there so that we can get them to where they need and introduce them to things that they, how to save money, how to write a resume. Yes. Go back and get your GED. So important. Yes. They've got to be educated because with education, you can't be stopped. Mm hmm. Because that's yeah. something that no one can take, can take from away. You. Can yeah. Take away. But so you know, it needs encouragement. And they needed to see women that look like them. That ain't always look like this. They probably had a few struggles along the way mm -hmm. to know that, oh, and a lot of the ladies, they lived at the housing authority, Joy. A lot of the ladies that we go to church with or went to church with, they lived at the housing authority. But the young ladies, like, well, you lived at the housing authority? Couldn't believe it. Because, you know, they're so put together, Miss Nelson, now. They didn't believe that. So to know that they could have been people that lived at the housing authority, it really encouraged them. That exposure is super important because when folks aren't exposed to things, they don't even understand what all is available to them right. and what things they can reach for. Right. And when it comes to healthcare, when you're in, when you, when your world is small mm -hmm. and there's not necessarily um, the best education, so if the school system where you live is not the best, right. and you're not reading on grade level by third grade if the grocery stores don't have access to fresh produce or there's not even a grocery store in your neighborhood yep. um, if there are not things like sidewalks and lighting like you referred to mm -hmm. um, if they're not safe play spaces um, if people are fighting or there's crime going on in the street yeah. you know there, there's not places for you to run and play and exercise. There's not places for you to be able to go to a Whole Foods or a Fresh Market. Um, and if, if you could afford or that, right? right? So um, when people often say, oh, well, those people over there are so unhealthy, right. you know, we have to think about what are we saying? Yes. Do those people have access to a healthful lifestyle? Right. Is it possible for them? So. One of the things that Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice at Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, our president and dean always would say to us is, look at the person in front of you and think what's possible for this person. And you gotta, you gotta start to think about that. And people will say, you know, um, well, you need to do this and you need to do that and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And that's really hard when you don't have boots. <laughs> you exactly. know, exactly. so um, if you want someone to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, a pair of boots is essential. Exactly. Exactly. So you got to be able to help them get those boots right. first. Exactly. Just the basic foundation. Exactly. And then once they have a basic foundation, then they can rise. Rise. Exactly. Um, 
One of the things I wanted to ask you about was this book reading that you mentioned, The Color yes. of Law. Yes. What What did you find most interesting about how, what they talked about with regard to housing? Well, the most interesting thing was, like, somebody said public housing was never created for Black people. Mm -hmm. But the concept is all that public housing is all about Black people. Now we comprise 98% of public housing but it never was intended for us to be able to use. They did it so that when the military, the wars were happening, you could stay at the housing authority, but you also could bring along your family members to stay. So when we couldn't stay, we had to live 40 miles out. Mm -hmm. So we had to drive 40 miles to the job when they lived five seconds from the job. Wow. So all the money I made went to transportation. So this was during the time of industrialism. The, so we want to make sure our workforce can get there, there right away. Right away. We mm -hmm. need them. Even the wars, they didn't want us to fight the wars, but then they needed us. So then they tagged us along. So what they did was create a basement for the black people to live in inside of the housing. So you still couldn't live in apartments, but you could live at the basement area of it. But unlike the white soldiers, you couldn't bring your family. Wow. So they were still separated. And all of this was done through the government, through the people that had power, people that are in politics, our congressmen, those people created these systems and practices that they could just say something and it became almost an ordinance or a law, like blockbusting. Meaning they'll come out and say, hey, the Negroes are moving in. So all the white people would move out. Then they would sell the house to you, but at four times the price that it's actually worth. So I want home, I spent all my money, but can I look keep it? Then there's no money to live in the home. And it was just amazing how someone could just say something and it almost became law. Wow. And they practiced it, whatever they said. And then they started to practice those things. That was so eye-opening. Like I knew what the public housing was, but to just hear the certain terms, the du jour segregation. Those are just those Jim Crow laws that they started to create, but they just could say it and it became law. It was never written. It was just an unwritten rule and the whole community would buy into it, the white community, and even our Supreme Court. They never struck any of that down. They never said people couldn't do it. They just said it wasn't a law to say they couldn't do it. Yeah, very interesting. You know, I was watching a documentary on redlining and they talked about how within certain mile radiuses that um, they decided where they would put things like banks and um, the best schools and parks and uh, recreation and where resources would be placed, where hospitals would go, where doctor's offices would be placed, how they were going to plan the city. Yes. And then on the outskirts, they might build uh, public housing or lower income housing. And in terms of where they would place grocery stores, where they would place attractions, where you know tourist dollars would come in. Yep. Um, all of this was planned. It was so interesting to me. And then you find that help actually can be tracked by zip codes. Yep. People who live in the most unhealthy zip codes are usually folks who are within these red line targeted areas that were made, literally made, to be impoverished areas. Yes, and that is so true. In the book, it, it talks about that, how they deliberately would, and like you say, they built these projects, but they would build them outside. Now they put up, say, a playground there, but it'd be next to an industrial park. Right. Where it's With their smoke, environmental and toxins and, and flooding. Yeah. Uh, uh, like these little ponds that children just fall in and drown. Like, and then they, they're flood zones. So you can't build or make it better. And you can't put anything there. So it becomes swamp land. Right. So swamp land, nobody buys. So those are areas where you might have made a beautiful part, but the white people were not going to buy there. But we were so desperate for housing, we would, and we'd be stuck next to that. And then you'd wonder why maybe your child has asthma or they all of a sudden acquire a brain brain cancer because they're next to these um, electrical hubs mm -hmm. that supply electricity, but that was all that was afforded to us. Wow. That was all that was given, our other choices, and we wanted to be, we did want to be out of the ghetto. 
-hmm. We didn't want to live that way. We didn't create it that way. How they think that we destroyed the homes. You just can't, black people just don't sit somewhere and it tears up. If you do not do the maintenance on your house, it's gonna deteriorate. Absolutely. Not because you're there in black, it's because you didn't take care yeah, of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's what happened. You know, it requires maintenance, it requires upkeep. Yeah. And if you don't have the money you can't. to do that, you, you can't, can't, can't do that. Exactly. Um, and home ownership is really the foundation of generational wealth. It is. That's how you gain equity. equity is when you own your home, you own your land. Yes. And when you are living in um, in low-income housing or in uh, public housing or Section 8, you don't own it. And so it becomes an issue of, okay, how am I going to pass down wealth to my children, my children yep. and their children? And it almost becomes impossible for you to leave a legacy yes. for the next generation. Yes. And so I, what, if anything, um, do you see as the way to help your residents begin to have that piece of the American dream, that home, owning that home and building that generational wealth where they can lay a foundation for their family to build yeah, and see, we already started those programs. So we know residents that we have, and people tend to think nobody passes those words. And it's true, some don't. They are now, since I've been there in 2014, our residents are required to work. So if you're able to work, able bodied, you have to gain employment. What we didn't do was just say, hey, go out and get a job just anywhere, just to pay your bills. We put them in training programs so that they can get some skill set certifications and work. Mm -hmm. So when that income increases, we introduce them to home ownership so that they can start this process. But our process starts with, let's make sure you understand your payroll. Some of our residents didn't understand the simple FICA SSS on the pay stub. We went that far to teach them what those boxes are right. on their check stub. BBNT partnered with us and gave them and allowed them to open free checking accounts. They didn't have checking accounts. Mm -hmm. They didn't have direct deposit. So let's teach you how to save your money. Let's teach you how to buy a CD. Let's teach you how to save for your children's college if they want to go. But we had to teach the basic things that we take for granted because we may have learned it at our houses, but we taught them the basic things, how to take care of a home. It's one thing to live in an apartment and I just call somebody to fix something. But when you have your home, you're responsible for the roof, the flooring. We go that far to tell you now you really got to save and put back in case something does happen. And they started to purchase renters in China. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Because they didn't think it was worth anything because, see, they think this is not mine, so why do I need to insure? They never thought about the content. So ownership. Ownership. Stop, starts right there. There. In the house. I own this chair. Yeah. I own mm -hmm. that desk. Those are your things. You don't own the physical building. But if something were to happen to the building, we have insurance, but your contents belong to you, and you want to be able to replace those things. Credit. They don't have credit established. Yeah. So they had to understand, I've got to get a credit card, but you don't have to get one and max it out, but you need to get one to establish your credit because you've got to have credit to buy the home. Right. Buy a car. Going with them, George, to do these things. A lot of them were afraid to do it. Right. Because they maybe had never seen it, they never did. been there, never had an opportunity. Or thought they'd be ripped off. Yeah. They thought they were going to be ripped off because they, what did they go to the buy here, pay here store? Right. So we were like, no. Like, we are like rental centers. We try to teach them how much you're paying for that versus saving and maybe buying it or going somewhere maybe and getting a loan from the credit union and then go buy your furniture because you're going to have a lower interest rate over here. Right. So, and that also contributed to when they're using the rental centers, we noticed they would buy used mattresses mm -hmm. and then they would get bad rugs. Oh, wow. Which is not healthy. Right, exactly. And they were being bitten, and their kids were, and didn't even realize it. And a bed bug treatment, it's like $3,500 to treat that apartment. Wow. That we do cover, but Jordan was too scared to report it. Well, I mean, 
I think that there is such a, um, I mean, this conversation is just so good <laughs> because <laughs> you, you have to think about all the things that can potentially affect the health of a person who, but because of where they live, right. like from the outside to the inside. And one thing that I've heard all the time as an obstetrician is the welfare mom. Mm -hmm. You know, the mom who has all these kids and who is not, not married and the man is not in the household and, you know, all that sort of thing. And people are saying, oh, it's all these welfare moms that are getting welfare. First, I know for sure that, you know, Black women are not the majority of people on welfare. Black people are not the majority of people on welfare because black people are not the majority, right? right? We're a minority <laughs> by definition. But um, I want you to kind of comment there on mm -hmm. what happened. I have heard in the past that there were just areas where women and children could stay, but the men could not. And so the black families were separated in public housing. What is that still the case, or, or how does that work? Well, it was never the case. That's okay. something. Okay. Um, any and to me, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of this. This is one rule that I just don't like for the government or HUD because you are gonna extract that black man from the family. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when you apply for housing, say you apply, but you have a boyfriend, they don't place him on the lease. Oh, okay. He has to be listed. Joy has to be listed. James has to be listed. You don't have to be married, but both adults have to be listed. So what that is called when you don't list James, you're called an unauthorized guest. Mm -hmm. An unauthorized guest can't live in the unit more than 14 days in a year. So he could stay 14 days in a year, but at some point you got to add him to the lease. Mm -hmm. The reason that I believe women didn't, because guess what? When we add him to the lease, the income is going to increase. The rents are going to increase. Oh, so okay. So there's two incomes that we have to count. Oh, okay. And it's fear. It's it's really fear that if I do add James, and what if James does have a warrant? Mm -hmm. But what if it's just for speed? Oh, what if James leaves anyway? And right. now I have him on there and, and I can't afford it by myself. Self. And if James is on there, you're going to have to evict him. He can leave, but you're going to have to evict James to get his name off that lease. Wow. So, Because that's a Georgia law, not ours. But once he becomes a leaseholder, he has to be evicted to get his name off that lease. So men can stay in the housing authority by themselves. They don't have to have kids. That's a myth. You can stay in the housing authority with a felony. But it has to be something that we go through. So I created a word. We're going to discuss with you about your felony. Because if this thing's been 10 years and you've made improvements and you've lived a life, why can't we forgive you and give you a chance? Now, no sex offender is going to live in the house or it's a federal regulation. Mm -hmm. But if you wrote bad checks 10 years ago, how harmful can you really be? Women just didn't add their, or some women that are married haven't added their husbands to the lease. So what happens is you get upset with me. So you go to the office and tell that I got a boyfriend. That's how we find out. Wow. <laughs> we never, like, we're not investigating you, but we get into it or something, and then we find out. I encourage the women to add their boyfriends to the list. I need you to be in the home. The children are there. Your sons need to see you. Mm -hmm. And you're the man. You need to work as well as she needs to work. Right. I don't need you walking out on her. You need to be responsible just like her. Mm -hmm. So stay together. Stay with her. Make right here if you want to, but I'm saying stay in your home. And I don't want them to live like every time somebody knocks on the door, you gotta hide your boyfriend. Right. I'm a grown woman. You shouldn't have to do that. You can have anybody over you want, but they have that fear that everything's gonna change and they couldn't. And it probably was a myth that was created that they couldn't do it, but you can do it. You can add your mom to the lease, you can add your grandma to the lease. Huh. Anybody can be on the lease. You can add your aunt to the lease if you want them to be on the lease, but if they do work, both incomes count toward what your rent will actually be. Hey, my last question is one of what do you, you know, what's your personal opinion about how we as a community can do better to help folks 
who are uh, living in lower income housing or living in the housing authority to um, to live healthier lifestyles and to to get those boots, to get the foundation to build on and to help uh, lay a foundation, a legacy for their children and their children's children. Because in my mind, a healthy community, a thriving community is a community where everybody has the same economic opportunities, they have the same educational opportunities, the same uh, opportunities for home ownership, the same opportunities to give of their gifts and their talents and be productive citizens. And the thing about it is, is that a rising tide lifts all boats. Yep. And so when we help other people rise, we also oh, rise. Exactly. So what do you think that we as a community need to do to help people rise out of poverty? One thing that I think is so essential, and we've got to get ourselves wrapped around and move ourselves out the way, out of the way and say this is not about us because some people think it's about them. But this is a bigger process, as you just said, and I said it earlier today, so this is just a bind. I understand I may have to give up something that I may desire just so the next person can move up. I don't mind giving my space for somebody else. Because I think I'm gonna win. I'm still gonna win if I just happen to say, you know, let's just stop this, I'll let you come. We've gotta learn to do that more. Stop duplicating services. If we got the best OPGYN in town, let's use her. Let's send our women this way so that they can see that. And we got to speak on the same sheet of music. So when we don't think the communities are thriving, can we all talk to the city council that the community's not thriving? You know, let's bond together and do that. But if I'm saying a message, you're saying a message, and we're just pulling at each other, I want them to know that everybody thinks this, even though we don't live in the community, but it's not thriving, and we need access to this. We don't need more liquor stores across from the housing authority. Right. Because my residents that may have issues would rather buy a dollar beer than pay their dollar rent. Mm -hmm. And I want to address the welfare mom. We don't have a lot of welfare moms. Like, we, they're required to work. The last numbers I got, 32 people are not working. But that could be a man that's not working. But we have 32 people out of over 400 that are not working. Wow. Because we would try to get them to understand it. And we do push entrepreneurship. We have people that are skilled. They can do hair, they can cook. They have a lot of skills. So we want them to, hey, maybe you can start your own business. They can start their own business at the housing authority. All they do is start the business and it can be inside of their home, like anybody else. Right. That becomes their income to pay their rent. I run this business out of my apartment. <laughs> right, you know? that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. But I think as, as a, a culture of black people, we really gotta find what each community needs. Meaning, you come to my community, I go to your community, we're working together. But everybody is hearing us say, we gotta have these services. And we may have to, for a while, go to them and provide the services. Mm -hmm. We may have to have those like food trucks or a truck parked on the property and service the people that way. Because a lot of them don't have cars and we have transportation. But still, a lot of them that are elderly, they don't want to leave their apartment, but we may have to go door to door providing that service. You know, we've tried to introduce the healthy foods. You know, they'll come out, but they don't understand what cauliflower is. Really. Hmm. So is yeah. that is that exposure and introduction yes. and giving people opportunity to try something new. new. Um, and I think that's huge. That's really huge yeah. because if you've never been exposed and you don't know what to, if someone just hands you something, you don't know what to really exactly. do with it. You exactly. know, um, that's not going to be very helpful. Right, right. And when you see the community, I would like to see our doctor's office right in our community. Mm -hmm. Like right sitting there on White's Road, yeah. you know, because I'm competing with three liquor stores wow. that are across the street from each other. And these are things that are done by design. Yes. And I think that we need to stop doing that. Yeah. We need to start putting positive images, okay. positive attractions, things that, yes. you know, that are going to help people, you know, and not necessarily um, fast food restaurants, right. liquor stores, 
um, pawn shops, the lottery. Uh, lottery stores. And it's not that there's anything wrong with those exactly. types of businesses, but they should be more evenly distributed, exactly. you know, and not just placed in this one area where there is economic depression. Yes. So we, we need to be better about that and speaking up about that um, and, and advocating for some change. It's yes. like, hey, um, we need to put things um, that actually bring positive attention yes. into these communities. Yeah, we have to. Like yesterday, I was right by the housing authority, the store is there, so they have, we accept EBT. In the middle is a slit malt liquor and old English. Right. And we're I mean, messaging. Food, we're yeah. messaging because what we don't realize is that when we exclude certain people from certain things, yes. we're messaging to them that that's not for you. For you. And you that's don't deserve for other it. people. That's not for you. Yeah. That you don't deserve that. Yes. You, you can't have that. Exactly. You, that is unattainable for you. Right. And that's so wrong because those are the things that we should healthy foods yes, you know is yes. something we should be able exactly. to attain yeah. um being able to get a good education is something we, we should, should be able, able to, to attain. attain exactly a uh, good health care something we should be able to attain yes. so i think it's just very um it's 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 something that we have to all be more mindful of. And for those folks who are decision makers and people yes. who are planning communities, start to be mindful of that. Yes. Who might you be excluding? Who else might need access to some of these things that you're building or planning or putting up? Uh, because that is the way that we drive change. And as we begin to try to build trust and to um, really embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion and a sense of belonging, in our community, those are things that really make a huge difference. Representation matters. Yes. People need to see themselves. Yes. Um, and they, they need do. to see that things are attainable for them. Um, and so I just thank you so much for coming and talking to me about this topic yes. today. Y'all make sure you stay tuned because we're going to be talking about the other social determinants of health, including economic status, environmental factors. We're going to um, definitely be talking some about access to health care, like how yes. do we get access, whether insurance, Medicaid, self-pay. So there are lots of things that affect health um, and not just being able to get into a doctor's office or a hospital, but all of the other factors surrounding that. So make sure that you are staying tuned on BTV or on my YouTube channel so that you can catch all of this. And ooh, did I tell y'all we're on Roku now? Yes, shout out to April Russ, the boss, for getting BTV on Roku so you can even stream us now. Okay. So we're going to catch y'all next time, girl gang. Peace.